Bernard Levinson holds the Berman Family Chair in Jewish Studies and Hebrew Bible at the University of Minnesota, where he is also a professor of law and of classical and Near Eastern studies. He obtained his PhD in Near Eastern and Judaic studies at Brandeis University. He's also been a visiting scholar at the Johannes Gutenberg School in Mainz, Germany, as well as at the Berlin Institute for Advanced Study and the Israel Institute for Advanced Study. He is renowned for his books on Deuteronomy, uh, both a more perfect Torah, which is not a long book, but it's very profound. Um, and you'll find plenty of examples of chiasmus in his books. So let me get right to it. There can be little doubt that ancient Near Eastern scribes, including those in ancient Israel, were well trained in the wide range of technical devices associated with the composition, copying, transmission, editing, collation, revision, reworking, and interpretation of texts. My focus today will be on one of the most interesting of these devices, the literary chiasm, in which textual content is ordered in A, B, C, C prime, B prime, A prime or X-shaped pattern. In many cases, once this pattern is recognized within a chapter or literary unit, an ostensibly haphazard or difficult to follow textual sequence gains a sense of order as a logical structure emerges from the text. As such, recognition of the chiasm provides an intellectual and religious gain for the reader. Moreover, a study of chiasm can provide a window into how scribes and editors worked with texts in antiquity. These are the words of uh, Professor Levinson. I first met John Welch on July 27, 1988 at the fifth biennial international conference on Jewish law at the Boston University School of Law, where we were each presenting our work. Our work has regularly intersected and we have collaborated on the Biblical Law Group of the Society of Biblical Literature. I was therefore honored to receive this invitation to share my work at this Jubilee Symposium and regret that a diagnosis of pneumonia prevents me from attending and reading this paper personally. Now I need to fess up at the beginning that my research focus is less on the chiasm as an isolated literary device than on what the chiasm can tell us about the compositional history of a text, how it came to be written or edited. My primary interest is in the legal, literary, and religious history of ancient Israel. In the nearly three decades of research and publication since the uh, auspicious meeting with Professor Welch, I have investigated the full range of literary devices that were employed in the editing, copying, transmission, revision, and interpretation of texts using the contents of cuneiform literature in Akkadian and Ugaritic, as well as the reception of the biblical text in Second Temple Judaism and the Dead Sea Scrolls. I want to mention two major concerns I've had with how some scholars have made use of chiasms. First, the criteria for constructing the chiasm in a number of cases can often become, to use the technical term, wobbly. These criteria can shift between thematic correspondence and lexical coherence and sometimes work much better in English than in the original Hebrew. They sometimes overlook repetitions of the same words in other structural components of the chiasm that could throw off the neat symmetry if they were taken into account. And this is a major criticism that uh, Bernie brings to bear. Don't, you don't want to ignore those, those dangling uh, uh, repetitions that you don't fit your preconceived notions. Second, too often there is a prevailing assumption that chiasm always points to the work of an original author, original ancient author, and therefore provides evidence for the antiquity and literary coherence of an ancient text. When this happens, the chiasm, which I would prefer to view as a neutral device, having a range of uses and a diversity of functions, gets taken up into something like a scholarly culture war. In my experience, this has frequently been the case in the use of chiasm by some religiously conservative scholars, both Christian and Jewish, who use the chiasm as an argument against the standard tools of biblical criticism and source criticism. 
I find that approach methodologically problematic. To my way of thinking, this approach is too narrow and inconsistent with the historical evidence. Ancient scribes were much more gifted, both as composers and as editors, than we often give them credit for. They worked within a scribal curriculum. They were literate and well-trained. They could use the same tool for, for multiple functions. These functions included creating literary elegance, plot complications, bold rethinking of religious and cultural conventions, critical engagement with the past, and imagining new religious, legal, ethical possibilities. My focus will be on this more dynamic and complex role of chiasm in the Hebrew Bible. I want to highlight the versatility of chiasm by presenting a series of cases that demonstrate how chiasm points to the role of editors reworking traditions, responding to earlier texts, and transforming them. <clears throat> this is Exhibit 1, Case 1, having to do with a chiastic relationship between the creation account in Genesis 1 and the flood narrative in Genesis 6. And you can readily see how they um, have a reversal of the order of creation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I'm going to skip this section. But I do want you to see the, the point that he's making here. Uh, Noah is the new Adam. It's a recreation. And the animals and the humans are placed in reverse order in each of these, and that's on purpose. Um, let me go directly to the second uh, point that he wants to make. This is case study two, integrating law and narrative uh, with his primary interest on Deuteronomy and uh, 11 and 12. My second example demonstrates how chiasm was used as a structuring device for creating a single coherent text out of diverse material. Here we turn our attention to the text of Deuteronomy, on which my friend Brother Seeley will also speak. The materials now assembled in the book of Deuteronomy have a complex literary history and very likely arose from several different sociological contexts within ancient Israel. They represent diverse literary genres, they contain different kinds of Hebrew linguistic expressions and rhetoric, and they drew upon earlier texts, both Israelite and Near Eastern. In some cases, later layers may disagree with and modify earlier layers to express a new religious understanding of the covenant and of God's will. One obvious example of the diversity of materials in Deuteronomy is the way the legal corpus of chapters 12 through 26, a collection of laws, has been embedded in a narrative frame consisting of chapters 1 through 11 at the beginning and 29 through 34 at the end. Almost like you have a prologue, then you have the laws, and then an epilogue. Uh, before turning to Deuteronomy, let me first point out an historical precedent for this kind of composition. The famous Hammurabi's Code, discovered in 1901 and dating to 1755 BCE, has a similar composite literary structure. The legal corpus consists of 280 casuistic laws, was embedded into a mythopoetic frame consisting of that prologue and epilogue. The literary frame differs from the laws in dialect, grammar, imagery, and point of view. First person versus third person uh, discourse. We have good evidence that this literary frame and the legal collection originally circulated independently, yet were combined together by scribes to make a powerful statement about the monarch's commitment to justice. Hammurabi is by no means the only monarch to have uh, codified laws. Similarly, in the case of Deuteronomy, despite the diversity of materials contained within it, Deuteronomy is clearly a well-structured book whose editors worked carefully to integrate the different literary genres of their sources. They provided editorial transitions at key literary seams, much like a mechanical engineer would use a gusset plate to create the strongest possible joint between the beams and girders of a bridge and the bridge's columns. One of the primary devices for making such a transition was, in fact, the chiasm. 
A case in point is the connection between Deuteronomy's narrative introduction in chapters 1 through 11 and its legal corpus in chapters 12 through 26. As you can see from Exhibit 2, the editors crafted a superscription introducing the legal, legal corpus in 12.1 that elegantly repeats in chiastic order the four key elements from the very end of the narrative introduction in chapter 11. A, possess. B, the land that the Lord is giving. C, the admonition to take care to observe. And D, the meta-reference to the laws and rules. This kind of chiasm represents the handiwork of a skilled editor or redactor, seeking to weave together the warp and woof of diverse literary genres to create an integrated composition that goes beyond the sum of its parts to make a new theological statement about the history and terms of Israel's covenant with God. The well-trained scribe is both a creative theologian and a well-trained editor who worked within a literary tradition. Case three. Deuteronomy's Renewal and Transformation of Israelite Religion. My third case study examines Deuteronomy 12 as a whole and provides another example of a chiasm used in editorial attempts to unify diverse materials. The text contains the full history of the various attempts to come to terms with and justify the religious innovations of Deuteronomy uh, that Deuteronomy introduces in this chapter. The text mandates two major reforms of Israelite religious technically, uh, dis religion technically described at, as cultic centralization and cultic purification. First, it prohibits all sacrifice at the local altars prevalent throughout the countryside and requires the complete destruction of all such altars. The chapter stipulates repeatedly that all sacrifice should instead take place exclusively at, the, at a single site, quote, the place that Yahweh shall choose, unquote. Deuteronomy's circumlocution for Jerusalem at its temple uh, is, is that, that very phrase. Second, although prohibiting in the strongest possible terms the local sacrifice of domestic animals for purposes of worship, it does grant permission for local secular slaughter of these animals for food. With that concession, the chapter forges for the first time in Israelite religion a, a distinction between the cultic sacrifice of animals on an altar and their secular slaughter not at an altar. Deuteronomy 12 is generally regarded by historical critical scholars as composite and characterized by redundancy. The chapter is conventionally divided into four originally independent laws, each concerned with cultic centralization and a concluding paragraph concerned with cultic purity. The formulaic command for the centralization of sacrifice occurs six different times with some slight variations. The concession for secular slaughter recurs twice. The accompanying stipulation that the blood in cases of secular slaughter should not be consumed, but rather poured out upon the earth like water also recurs twice. The rationale for centralization is in each case different, and there is no obvious attempt to integrate the various repetitions into a coherent whole in substantive legal terms. Grammatical anomalies increase the sense that the chapter is disjointed. The second person addressee of the law shifts without explanation from primarily second person plural to singular although uh, neither section is entirely internally consistent. The editors responsible for the final form of the legal corpus were well aware of this diversity of materials and took steps to provide transitions. Exhibit four shows the previously mentioned superscription provides the key to how the editors organized the four centralization laws, geographical location, and historical duration become criteria for legal adherence. The laws that follow, the superscription of reaffirms, apply geographically in the promised land of Canaan and are historically valid while Israel inhabits that land. Quote, these are the statutes and laws that you shall take care to observe in the land that Yahweh, the God of thine ancestors, has given thee to possess. 
all the days that you live upon the earth, unquote. Within this superscription, a shift occurs in the grammatical number of the addressee from second person plural at the beginning and end to second person singular in the land uh, donation formula in the middle. This number shift in the superscription represents a further editorial device to prepare the reader for the number change in the laws that follow. In the final redaction of this chapter, that is to say, in the final edition of it, the laws are arranged in a chiastic structure, A, B, C, C prime, B prime, and A prime. Laws one and five, beginning and end, each address issues of cultic purification and polemicize against syncretism with Canaanite practices. Laws two and four each present the conditions, whether historical or geographic, for the inception of centralization and secular slaughter, thereby doubly framed and functioning as the focus of the chapter in Law 3, which commands centralization and local secular slaughter. Law 5, which makes no reference to cult centralization, was most likely added as a late editor, or added by a late editor. Nevertheless, the means of the law, uh, the law's focus on cultic purity, the editor establishes multiple points of contact with Law 1, and thereby provides the chapter with an elegant chiastic frame And this shows you the, the actual chiastic frame at the beginning and end. As a result of such editorial design, the chapter appears simultaneously composite, redacted from five originally independent paragraphs, and cohesive with the five paragraphs integrated into an ordered structure. This double nature of the chapter has engendered a double approach to its scholarly interpretation. The dominant approach in source critical scholarship is to attempt to me uh, by means of diachronic analysis to isolate its earliest stratum deemed variously deuteronomic or pre-deuteronomic and then to assign the other paragraphs to successive later editors. The most recent monograph, for example, finds two pre-exilic, one early exilic and one late exilic stratum uh, such confident precision raises more questions than it answers since the criteria for distinguishing two pre-exilic deuteronomic strata from one another when each is Josianic and presupposes centralization, yet neither of which is deuteronomistic, are never made clear, either linguistically or legally, uh, legal historically. The problem with many such approaches is that while properly emphasizing the composite frame of the chapter, they overlook both the evidence for the secondary imposition of a chiastic editorial structure and the difficulties that such deliberate redactional reworking pose for reconstructing literary history in the first place. Conversely, a number of scholars have taken the opposite approach, denying that the repetitions in the chapter are signs of redundancy and composite origin. These scholars reject diachronic analysis altogether. They strive for synchronic solutions. Using this chiastic structure to argue for the unity of the text and explaining the repetitions away as deliberate rhetorical emphasis. However, almost all proponents of this synchronic approach fail to do justice to the degree of philological difficulty in the chapter. They restrict the difficulty to mere repetition alone as if that problem did not interlock with the number of uh, change of the addressee. Rhetorical emphasis might account for the former problem, but not the latter, let alone both together. Moreover, proponents of the synchronic method frequently commit logical error. They have from the claim of rhetorical or literary structure to that of compositional coherence without taking into account that such structures may with equal justification represents secondary editorial attempts to impose coherence upon originally composite material. Even if a ring pattern or chiasm, for example, can legitimately be identified in a text, it does not follow automatically that the whole text represents the original composition of a single author. After all, that an editor has obscured textual seams does not mean that there are no seams. No matter how adroitly the disparate material may have been integrated through the use of redactional bridges, 
The very structures, in other words, that suggest compositional unity to some scholars may actually lead to the opposite conclusion once the full degree of philological complexity of a text is recognized. Each approach, both the diachronic and the synchronic, contributes to the discussion, but neither is in itself sufficient to account for the text. A shift, is, uh, a shift in perspective is necessary. As I show in my first book, Deuteronomy and the Hermeneutics of Legal Innovation, the key to the composition of Deuteronomy 12 is the way it engages and transforms prior Israelite literary history. Deuteronomy 12 is exegetical, not in the sense of passive explication of the meaning of a text, but rather more profoundly in using textual interpretation in order to sanction a major transformation of legal, cultic, and literary history by means of literary reworking and by ascribing the departure from convention to the authoritative religion. Deuteronomy 12 does not simply represent centralization law, as if that were some immediate positive legal requirement intended directly to act upon society. Instead, what is at stake is something broader, both theoretical and practical, not simply the, in, the innovation of centralization, but also its careful justification and defense in light of previous Israelite literary history. This hermeneutical issue helps explain the problematic structure of each of the chapters uh, of much of the chapter. Deuteronomy 12 was to a large extent representative of an, as an anthology of, rep, of repeated attempts not simply to command but also to justify the innovation of centralization. And the centralization he's speaking here is allowing sacrifice only in Jerusalem and only there, whereas in the past sacrifice could be conducted nearly anywhere in Israel. The editors were conservative and retained the multiple previous attempts to explain centralization without obscuring the differences between them or eliminating the previous layers of tradition, much as a Supreme Court ruling will retain judicial dissents. This approach helps account for the chapter's redundancy and provides a new perspective for understanding its literary structure and hermeneutical dynamics. My final case study ignores my final case study explores Deuteronomy 7, uh, 9 through 10, a text in which the chiasm points to the intentional literary and theological structure of the unit. Most European scholars have failed to recognize this structure as they divide the passage up into separate literary layers. Uh, examine of this, examination of this case equally points to textual coherence as a complex idea since the text is the product of a skilled scribe commenting upon and reacting to an earlier layer of tradition. Deuteronomy 7 thus confirms the power of chiasm to allow us to recover the remarkable ability of ancient Israelite scribes and editors to overturn established notions of divine justice and to imagine new possibilities that focus on individual responsibility. The Decalogue provides the point of departure for examining this passage. The second commandment prohibits the worship of deities other than God and offers the following rationale for the prohibition. For I, Yahweh your God, am, am an impassioned God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing kindness to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. The Hebrew participles translated those who love and those who reject are not simply emotional, but legal terms. Reflecting the terminology of ancient Near Eastern state treaties, love designates political loyalty to the suzerain, while reject denotes acts of treason. Israelite authors took over this secular treaty terminology together with the concept of a binding legal tie in order to conceptualize the nation's relationship with its God as a covenant. These ancient Near Eastern treaties were understood as being made in, in perpetuity. They were therefore binding not only upon those immediately signatory to them, but always also upon succeeding generations. 
The punishment for violating the treaty, therefore, applied not just to those who originally swore their agreement to it, but also to their progeny, that is, to their children and their grandchildren. That principle underlies God's threat in the Decalogue that he will visit his rage upon the third and fourth generation of those guilty of breaking the covenant. The Decalogue thus formulates a doctrine of the transgenerational consequences of sin. Although it is my parent who wrongs God, I and my children and my grandchildren are punished for the parent's wrongdoing, independent of any particular wrongdoing on our part. The text is remarkably silent about whether the actual sinner is punished for his or her own offense or whether the expected punishment might be completely displaced onto the progeny. There, here emerges a fundamental ethical and theological problem. Is it not odious for God to punish innocent persons merely for being the progeny of sinners? A remarkable transformation of this Decalogue doctrine can be found just two chapters later within the legal corpus of Deuteronomy, as shown in Exhibit 7. The text presents itself as an address by Moses to the nation of Israel given on the eve of the nation's entry into the promised land of Canaan, 40 years after God originally delivered the law to the people at Mount Sinai. According to the editorial superscription in the biblical text, Moses here explicates the law that God had earlier proclaimed and exhorts the nation to obedience. In this new literary setting, Moses, while reviewing the past, ostensibly quotes the Decalogue and then preaches to the nation concerning it. Moses thus expounds upon divine justice. Know therefore that only Yahweh your God is God, the steadfast God who keeps his gracious covenant to the thousandth generation of those who love him and keep his commandments, but who requires those who reject him to their face by destroying them. He does not delay with anyone who rejects him. To his face he requites them. The vocabulary of this passage makes it clear that the Mosaic speaker alludes specifically to the Decalogue, which he has previously quoted, Deuteronomy 5. This reuse of the Decalogue is marked by a chiastic citation. The first person sequences of the dialogue, A, those who reject me, and B, those who love me and keep my commandments, is inverted in the new context in Deuteronomy 7. It is recast as a third-person report, and the order of the elements is reversed. B, those who love him and keep his commandments, and A, those who reject him. The Mosaic speaker purports to provide a homiletic paraphrase of the formula for divine justice in the Decalogue, but if we take a closer look, we see that the homily so fundamentally transforms the original as to revoke it. The speaker has strategically deleted references to the transgenerational consequences of sin and instead asserts the immediate punishment of the sinner. By implication, divine punishment for sin is restricted to the sinner alone. In contrast to the Decalogue, the progeny, who are here strikingly unmentioned, are not explicitly visited with divine punishment. In form, this passage demonstrates two types of chiasm. In addition to the chiastic, addition, uh, chiastic citation of the Decalogue already noted, we can see that Deuteronomy 7 verses 9 through 10 is structured as a chiasm. The underlining shows how a key term from the original problematic text is cited. The retribution due to those who reject him, which alludes to those who reject me in the Decalogue. Once cited, however, the same term receives a new continuation. The new teaching of individual responsibility, as the italicized text shows in the center, the double annotation stipulates that God requites the sinner literally to his face. As the medieval Jewish commentator Rashi accurately saw, the phrase means in his lifetime. The annotations revive the divine punishment and restrict it so that it no longer extends across generations. The paraphrase of the source thus abrogates the source, which now propounds 
the doctrine of individual responsibility. The chiastic pattern of textual re re reworking, as shown in the diagram, frames and thus highlights Deuteronomy's ethical innovation marked by X. Uh, the, the introduction of the notion that God does not delay, does not delay retributive justice, that is that punishment no longer occurs transgenerationally. The, doctrine, uh, the doctrinal innovation is thus accomplished by means of textual reformulation. The doctrine of individual re retribution is not present in Deuteronomy 7 as a departure from the status quo. Instead, the new teaching is presented as consistent with the very doctrine that it rejects, as an authoritatively taught recitation of the original uh, theologumenon or divine proclamation. The author of this text marshals the very words of the formula for transgenerational punishment against itself. In key uh, its key terms are redeployed so as to abrogate transgenerational punishment and mandate individual retribution instead. And I'll skip that and go to the conclusion. I hope to have demonstrated the richness and range of uses of chiasm as a scribal device in antiquity. It has served to provide narrative suspense and plot complexity and as a way for editors to integrate law and narrative. We have seen how editors use the device to integrate a range of textual material from originally independent or diverse backgrounds, including texts that do not appear to agree with, the one, uh, with one another and that express divergent viewpoints to provide bridges and transitions for the reader, while still preserving the diversity of perspectives and viewpoints. We've also seen how editors can rework traditions and earlier texts to make powerful new theological statements about the nature of divine justice. The chiasm thus is more than simply a technical scribal device in the skilled hands of editors of ancient Israelite literature. The device was also an agent of the theological imagination, literary and religious creativity and cultural change. And Bernie adds a note, I wish I were present myself to field your inevitable questions and comments and we'll be very happy to hear from you via email. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Thank you. And anybody who wants to, uh, I'll give you his email address so you can direct comments to him directly. <clears throat> for Bob, how much weight should be given to redactional evidence for a late origin of a text versus evidence for an earlier origin, inscriptional or archaeological evidence. Uh, you, you have to evaluate every claim for redaction of a text on its own merits. In the case of the, the theory that Professor Levinson is working with, uh, the Deuteronomic Revolution is well known and well accepted by a wide range of people. A wide range of scholars assume that the Deuteronomic Revolution took place. And for us it has special meaning because it takes place in the midst of the life of Lehi. Uh, it is a powerful force and there are a variety of thoughts about what it means. Margaret Barker has one theory. Uh, I don't know what Bernie's opinions are on Margaret Barker. A few years back when I was in San Francisco at, at an annual meeting of the Society for Biblical Literature and the American Academy of, of Religion, uh, I asked Bernie his opinion and he had none. Uh, I don't know whether he even read Margaret Barker's views. Uh, but as I say, being the expert on Deuteronomy, he had no, no comment on that particular idea. What's the threshold for determining if the redaction of sources is the result of an author or an editor? What ways can we determine which is which? Well, Bernie went over many of the signals. There, there are editorial devices that are used throughout texts. When somebody's quoting an earlier text, he'll typically reverse the quotation, according to Seidel's law. Another way you can determine when somebody is making an interpolation is he'll begin by making a statement and once he finishes the interpolation, he'll repeat that statement. And this is called uh, repetitive resumption or wieder Aufnahme in the words of the uh, German scholars who came up with that idea. 
Uh, so there are a lot of literary devices used by editors that are dead giveaways to redaction and editorial work. The Book of Mormon is uh, very strongly edited by Mormon, and you can see all kinds of different documents being brought in. Uh, the Report of Zenith, for example. Uh, there are dead giveaways in the Book of Mormon, where you also have repetitive resumption, you also have uh, evidence of Seidel's Law, where uh, quotations are reversed deliberately. It seems that this idea of scribal work of redacting sources into chiastic structure would have much relevance for the Book of Mormon. Can you, Bob, comment on how this understanding of chiasmus and scribal activity might inform our approach to the Book of Mormon? Well, I've just done that, and uh, uh, there's a great deal to be learned. David Bakavoy has, has lectured and written a great deal on how biblical editorial techniques can be applied to the Book of Mormon, and I, I recommend that you go to his works on that very subject, and thank you.